Hello world, is Google Home spying on you? Why does Twitter keep getting hacked? And has China finally broken encryption with quantum computers? That's all coming up in today's roundup of cybersecurity tech news. Smart speakers spying on you might just be a bit of a meme, but a newly discovered bug in Google Home devices makes this meme a reality. A security researcher discovered a vulnerability which allows hackers to remotely gain full access to a Google Home device, allowing them to, well, do anything they want, including listen in on your conversations. The researcher behind this discovery explains he was messing with his Google Home and noticed how easy it was to add new users to the device from the Google Home app. I mean, it's as straightforward as entering an email address. Simple, really. But this simplicity tickled our white hat hacker the wrong way. So he investigated. After capturing HTTP traffic from the device, he analyzed how the process of adding a new user really works, discovering that after entering an email address, the app sends a HTTP request to Google servers, asking them to add the new user. The request is authenticated with three pieces of information, your device name, certificate, and cloud ID. So theoretically, if an attacker was able to get their hands on these three pieces of information unique to your Google Home, they could give themselves full access to your device. And it turns out that getting this trio of information is as simple as just asking the device for it. As long as you know a Google Home's IP address, you can just request the information from it using its built-in API. But the catch, of course, being a hacker would need to be on the same Wi-Fi network as the Google Home in order to send this request. And hacking a Wi-Fi router is a whole challenge in of itself, so this is a fairly big caveat. But this is when our researcher made yet another discovery. It's possible to remotely force a Google Home to spawn its own unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot that an attacker can connect to and use to send the query. This is done using what's known as a Wi-Fi deauthentication attack, or deauth attack for short, something we've seen quite a bit of on this channel. This attack exploits a flaw in the Wi-Fi protocol that allows a bad actor to kick devices off a Wi-Fi network and prevent them from reconnecting. It's basically a denial of service attack. At this point, the Google Home basically becomes kind of confused, and so it'll enter a kind of setup mode, spawning its own Wi-Fi network. An attacker can connect to this and then use that to query the API, get those three pieces of information, and then send a request to Google, giving them full control over the Google Home. But what then? I mean, it's difficult to see how this could be abused on a mass scale by financially motivated cybercriminals. Rather, this kind of vulnerability would be more useful for targeted attacks. I imagine it's the kind of thing that our friends over at the CIA might be interested in. And whilst that might sound like just pure speculation, we know for a fact that CIA hackers have more than a passing interest in smart home devices. In 2017, the Vault 7 leaks, courtesy of WikiLeaks, exposed the existence of something the CIA calls Weeping Angel, a tool which turns certain models of smart TVs into surveillance devices for the purpose of intelligence gathering. One way a Google Home device could similarly be turned into a surveillance tool is by using the legitimate Google Home feature, Routines. After gaining full access, a bad actor could set up a Google Home to call a certain phone number at a predefined time, with the miscreant muting their own microphone and listening in. But luckily, the security researcher who discovered this bug responsibly disclosed it to Google, and it's now been patched. For his efforts, Google awarded the bug hunter $107,000. Over the past few weeks, you will have seen reports of multiple Twitter hacks, but all is not as it seems, and there's a lot of confusion here, so let's investigate. The first thing that kicked off this drama was news over Christmas of a Twitter data leak comprising the details of 400 million users. If true, this would be the largest Twitter leak of all time. It was initially posted on Breach forums, with the leaker claiming, it includes emails and phone numbers of celebrities, politicians, companies, and normal users. With the poster suggesting Elon Musk should pay up now to avoid being fined millions by governments. Someone who claims to have spoken to the hacker said they were asking for $50,000, which is rather believable. And just on a side note, this is the first time a leaker themselves has given me a shout out in the comments. So that's cool. I guess I'm not sure how to respond to that. But anyway, 
They did post a bunch of sample data to prove the breach, so it all looked rather legit. But just days later, the forum thread disappeared. Turns out the leaker had been banned for the reason suspected lying about record count. You see, the figure of 400 million was ever so slightly off by about a couple hundred million. Another Breach Forums user, whose account was created just days ago, so it's probably the same guy, reposted the leak with duplicate entries removed. This time, only 200 million users are affected. I say only, but this is still the largest leak in Twitter history. One that is now public for anyone to download, with the miscreants reneging on their $50,000 demand. There's also no phone numbers in this dump, just names, handles, and email addresses. No doubt much to the disappointment of sim swappers. And this second post is what's caused some confusion, with some news websites reporting the two posts as being separate incidents, making it look like Twitter was under some kind of multi-pronged coordinated attack with 600 million people being hacked, which isn't the case. But regardless, 200 million is still a pretty big number. So where did all this data come from? For that, we have to go back in time to January of last year, when a vulnerability reported to Twitter's bug bounty program exposed how it was possible for an attacker to exploit Twitter's API to obtain the Twitter ID of any user by submitting a phone number or email address. This bug would have allowed a bad actor to test already public email and phone number lists against Twitter's API, matching them against Twitter IDs. And, well, it did. Because before this bug could be fixed by Twitter, it had already been exploited. The first known instance, which came to light last August, being a data dump of 5.4 million accounts. And now we have this latest dump of 200 million accounts, with potentially more breaches currently unknown. And whilst all these breaches must have been perpetrated over a year ago by this point, I mean, the bug that made all this possible was fixed last January, the bad actors will have likely spent the last year using, or well, should I say, abusing the dumps for their own personal gain before finally leaking them publicly. To make things worse for Twitter, they're already being investigated by the Irish Data Protection Commission for that initial dump of 5.4 million users. Adding a further 200 million to that number is pretty bad news, because Facebook, which fell victim to a similar data scraping incident in which 533 million users' details were leaked, was eventually fined a quarter of a billion dollars by the same government agency which is now investigating Twitter. I should point out, though, that the Facebook leak was quite a bit worse. In addition to names and phone numbers, it also included miscellaneous data like genders, occupations, locations, and marital statuses. Data which might seem kind of benign, but would be incredibly useful for bad actors launching phishing campaigns. It remains to be seen if Twitter will suffer a similar fine, but let me know in the comments. Did you receive a Have I Been Pwned notification? Chinese researchers claim to have found a way to break encryption using quantum computers. If true, this would have major security implications. I mean, it's long been known that quantum computers pose a significant threat to asymmetric encryption, the kind that uses a public and private key. But this was meant to be years away, so for researchers to claim they've now managed to break 2048-bit RSA encryption, the kind which underpins things like SSL certificates, is a big deal. But luckily, the truth is a little more complicated, and I mean complicated. So here's my brief and very high level overview of what's going on. When news of this research paper first broke, some very respected computer scientists were taking it rather seriously. But now that the dust has settled, the paper has more or less been dismissed as radically overhyped. The paper essentially claims that researchers have discovered a new way to factor massive numbers very quickly, thereby making it possible to break 2048-bit RSA encryption within a time frame relevant to humans, as in a lot quicker than the age of the universe. To do this, they've taken an algorithm and enhanced it with quantum technology. Thing is, the researchers only tested their hypothesis on a quantum computer with 10 qubits, nowhere near the 372 qubits that the paper says are required to actually break break encryption. And whilst their test on that 10 qubits quantum computer did work, the algorithm they're using is notorious for falling apart and just not working on larger scales. Leading some computer scientists to comment that this is one of the most actively misleading quantum computing papers they've ever seen. And whilst quantum computers that exceed the 372 qubits minimum are right around the corner, this isn't expected to make a difference. 
There are some other things that just don't add up. If this paper was undeniably correct, wouldn't the Chinese government be quick to censor this research and keep it for themselves? I mean, Beijing has a history of not being very happy when landmark exploits aren't reported to them first. Take log 4 shell After Alibaba responsibly disclosed the vulnerability to the Apache Foundation, the government responded by suspending Alibaba from an important information sharing partnership with the government. Regardless of this latest paper, quantum computers do pose a real risk to certain cryptographic algorithms. But in reality, to break RSA, it'd probably require millions of qubits rather than just hundreds. And those machines are still a way off. Having working code only to find out that the version it runs on is going end of life is frustrating. You would have to quickly migrate to the latest version with a bunch of code refactoring and rewriting. But not with Tuxcare. They help you plan the transition with their extended lifecycle support, which covers a range of Linux distros as well as PHP and Python. With Tuxcare, you can keep your existing code base and still receive security updates and patches for deprecated versions. This means that if your code base still meets your operational requirements, it can still meet your security targets, giving you time to plan your next move. Learn more about Tuxcare's extended lifecycle support by clicking on the link in the video description. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.